particles colliding at tremendous speed in this room, and uh, hopefully it's creating some good aesthetic vision for you when you go back to your rooms and, and, uh, and write. Uh, so today uh, we're talking about the, the difference in, in cross-platform writing, different media, uh, writing for film, writing for television, writing for the internet. Um, and so my esteemed panel here, I'd like to maybe begin with going down the panel and just introducing the audience to uh, briefly what's your experience writing in, or working in, in some way with other media besides the theater. And then I've got a couple of questions for you, and then uh, I want to open it up and get lots of questions from, from the audience. So scribble down the questions that you have so that we can make great use of our, uh, of our one hour that we have here today. So, um, uh, David, would you like to begin? Um, I, Steve, are we going to ask you <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess mo for most of my uh, uh, writing life, I've been a bounce back between theater and um, TV and film. And, and so uh, I've, I've worked in television and, and done and worked in film doing from like indie-ish sort of things to studio kind of projects. So I've always kind of balanced or tried to balance those things. So I've um, probably a poor film experience, screenplay experience actually than play experience. Um, I realize what I know since I'm in this but that's um, <laughs> Um, I have very little experience in, in film, um, but I do have a recent experience which might be interesting, which is the, the play that I wrote that is running here, The Favor, was actually made into a film last month. So the experience of doing that and how that was different than the actual play on stage was, was interesting to me. I mean, they really are the cast was different, the size of the cast was different, the way that it, 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 it built and the, how the story was different. That's my experience. <coughs> um, well, my primary focus is theater, but uh, I definitely am working in television um, right now uh, and have uh, been putting a lot of energy, especially we're starting development season now, after July 4th, it's like off to the races. So. Um, uh, focus in that area, I can feel comfortable definitely talking about TV stuff. And um, a little bit of comic book freelance writing, so. Uh, I'm a representation, I'm not a writer. Um, so I uh, work extensively in all medium. Um, my primary focus is uh, the playwrights, theatrical writing, um, but I do represent David, and as you can attest, um, Every writer that I represent has a screenplay, multiple screenplays, multiple TV ideas, plays, short stories, children books, all sorts of different um, uh, ideas that are sort of uh, at the forefront of their brain. And uh, part of what it is that I do is to try to focus their energy and att attention on what it is uh, that they should be focusing on. Um, I think a clear distinction should be made before we start getting into form and format um, is just some differences in terms of uh, the placement of the writer in different media. Um, though you may not feel this way, in the theater, um, the writer is the king. Uh, you retain copyright, you retain ownership of your work. And any producer um, that gets involved with producing the work, they're essentially renting the work from you. At the end of the run, it's yours. Um, when you sell a screenplay, it is no longer yours. Um, it is owned by the studio. And I know, you know, David has had examples, um, comic examples, that we can talk about of, um, they'll sometimes buy an idea and then completely run it, want to rework it, and um, the, the writer has zero recourse. I'm glad the worst moments of my life are comedic. Describe just <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, I don't think this could be a comedy. Well, sure, let's put it under the umbrella of comedy. The, the check yeah. here. Uh, the check here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, they have that clause in there, right, that they own it throughout the universe in perpetuity forever? Uh, throughout the known universe, which isn't to imply if additional universes are found, they will also own it there. From the case law. Yeah. Right. yeah. It doesn't really give you a realistic idea of their enthusiasm for the project. It says, well, they want to decorate every planet, every universe. <laughs> they must really love this idea. Yeah. Yeah. But also, as it was pointed out in another uh, panel yesterday, um, one of Susan Shulman's clients 
uh, had a project where a studio bought it simply to bury it. Really? So, uh, yeah. uh, it was a competing project. It, it was a project that was going to compete with the release of Julie and Julia, um, and they didn't want it to see the light of day. It's a fairly typical practice in Hollywood. That's fine. That so Being in turnaround. Pay for some debt. So, so the question I have for the panel, and anyone, anyone, uh, uh, feel free to answer this. Um, you know, as you attend play writing conferences, or you know, in my experience, I because I, I teach a lot of playwrights, there are sometimes when you encounter a script which was clearly conceived not as a stage play, but as something other than a stage play. As you sit down to write a piece, at what point do you realize this idea can be encapsulated on a stage? Or perhaps it's it's broader than that. It, it, it's got a, a different feel to it. It has perhaps a cinematic quality. When you sit down and conceive of an idea, is obviously the first thought: this is a play, this is a screenplay, this is a TV pilot, this is a, you know a mobiso for a, for you know phones. Any thoughts about that? Did you say mobiso? Did you a say mobiso? a mobile episode? Mobile episode. Mobile episode. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I've never heard that. I just know yeah. yeah. like terminology. We need another panelist. That's right. We need another. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have any Mobisodes? Uh, so uh, so uh, uh, you know, it's all the short content that now the telecommunication companies are, are buying to be able to sell. Yeah, no, I'm just, I, I got it from context, but it was fascinating. Like, I, I just think it <laughs> I think, uh, I mean, honestly, for me, and I think it's different for everyone, and I just got done saying earlier today to a bunch of you, but like, every writer has a different process, so everyone's going to approach things differently. For me, um, I don't, uh, not that I never would, just because we're live streaming this, and God knows who's watching, but. Um, I haven't written a lot of screenplay. I haven't done a lot of screenplay work because for me, that's such a different set of muscles that I'm just not equipped with, and like I haven't spent the time working those out at all. Um, but it's a very different thing when you sit down. Like once you're working in it, 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 abstractly it's not that different, but once you're actually trying to develop television, it's a very different thing when I sit down to write a television show that's gonna kick off something that you ostensibly want to run for 100 episodes into syndication than it is to sit down and write a play that has a beginning, middle, and an end and that you're probably not going to write a sequel to. Right. Um, those are very different things. And then the other thing I would say is that just for me, my theatrical work is theatrical. I don't. I mean, that sounded stupid to say <laughs> out loud, but it's, uh, it's, it's very, very, very theatrical. So it's something that if you were to translate it to uh, television or cinema, I think it would immediately die. And so it's just of those things for me become very different. Talk about that. It's um, aircraft carrier screenplay, uh, you know, Death Star screenplay. One person talking a lot, but you know, it's kind of like usually sort of a general, you know, it's an action, you know, it's something like something that should be on stage and it's like you know character driven things where you have a lot of dialogue. The fact is, unless you're doing like kind of a European independent film, the first note you're going to get anyway is if you have you know, more than a quarter of a page of dialogue, you know, you, know, you can't, it's a visual medium, it's a visual medium, you see that over and over, that things that are a, um, a small amount of dialogue on stage is considered a ridiculous amount of dialogue in film. And, yeah. um, and, and I think that's, that is the kind of character you want to show, but I think that, that distinction towards visual and not, which is, it's, which is between film and and theater, with television less so now, because everyone knows all the great television shows, the character development, and all the things that happen, all these great shows now, is a totally different thing. So you can obviously do great character work in that medium. But um, similarly, in, in terms of selling stuff, in terms of writing a pilot or something, you still need to, you can't um, express the kind of way that you have a certain arc of a character in a play. You can't do that in a pilot, because like uh, any of the great shows right now, you've got an arc that runs four seasons. So you can't do that in a 28 pages of a pilot. So it's um, that still just kind of puts it into a category of style of writing that you need to embrace. Yeah, one of the most consistent notes I give any of my writers who are, you know, primarily playwrights but then write a screenplay is show it, don't tell it. Um, because uh, there is an economy of theatrical writing that good playwrights use in terms of telling the complete story using only the dialogue that the characters are given. Um, and the playwrights also consistently typically wrap up scenes and moments and, and sort of fall back on, you know, they have great buttons on scenes. 
that it doesn't usually happen that way in screenplays. There's just a continuity of action that is sort of propelling things through. So, so this is a question maybe for for you, Bruce, as a as a talent writer. <clears throat> um, that, well, first of all, let me let me poll the room. How many people in here are just strictly playwrights? Raise them higher. Don't be ashamed to strictly be a playwright. Okay. How many people have dabbled in writing TV spec scripts? Like half hour, one hour format? Okay. Screenplays? Okay. What about something for a different medium, internet or anything like that? Okay. Everyone's so bashful. I mean, <laughs> what happened to all the progress we made this morning? <laughs> <laughs> what about novels? Let's liven it up. Come on. Uh, what about novels? Novels? Okay. Novella? <laughs> Haiku? <laughs> <laughs> and I know that there's at least one sonnet writer. You write sonnets, is that right? Yeah, okay. A sonnet in the Um So then, then let me ask you. Let me ask you this question because. I know when I lived in, in Los Angeles, at least for television writing, there was kind of a geographic necessity to be in Southern California. Now I know that you're LA based and you're New York and you're New York. It, it, do you see with the, any geographic necessity if you want to write film or television or new media to be in a certain market? Um, there's definitely geographic convenience to being in Los Angeles. Um, the process, and, and Dave, you might want to speak to this as well, and Steve can certainly as well, in terms of the development process um, in putting a TV show together, even a, a film together. Um, increasingly, a lot of writing is happening for less and less money. It used to be at every sort of writer's treatment, director's pitch, treatment, pilot, episode guide, you'd get paid. Um, well, now they just do a step deal. Exactly. So you get a little bit along the way. Exactly. Um, and you know, for clients that I have that are based in Los Angeles that are primarily TV and film people, they are meeting. They have three to six meetings a week, and you know, they're just and the rest of the time they're caught in traffic. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, and it's really about the the FaceTime and going out and frequently it's a general meeting that turns into a we have a project that we'd like you to do a writer's take on or we'd like to hear your you know ideas that you have. Um, Certainly, there's there's television production happening in, in other parts of the country and in New York, um, but there's as much TV film happening in New York as well. That's not I was going to say as there is theater in Los Angeles, but there's actually a lot. Of there's theater. tons of theater in Los Angeles. I know. I mean, it's a myth. Say that. It's a so, myth. Um, but uh, you know, it's, it's, again, geographic convenience for TV film. And um, I just want to say, I, but I also think that like I think that that's true. But I, I think the, the flip side of it that sometimes we forget as writers is that like when I was in San Francisco doing this residency, I was making trips, I was driving to Los Angeles to have meetings. And like you walk into the meetings and one of the first things they ask you is, when are you gonna move here? And part of it is that if, if they're gonna spend as much money as they're gonna spend not only on the script, but on trying to make the script into a thing that happens, they wanna know that you're serious and committed to it. And maybe you've proved that, maybe you've demonstrated that through your other work. Maybe you're coming to them from a place of I've had plays at Labyrinth, or I've had play, I've, I, you know I have a sustained kind of career. But if you haven't, they want you to live there because they want you to demonstrate your commitment to this thing that they're about to spend tons and tons of money on. And I don't know that that's always the right thing, but just generally that is a true thing. So you're from the Bay Area and then chose to relocate out of. I'm from Atlanta. Oh, okay. I went to grad school in New York, and then I just happened to through this NNPN that Nan was talking about yesterday, uh, get a year-long residency in San Francisco. At the end of that, I had no idea where I was, what I was gonna do because sans the residency money, right. I could not afford to live in San Francisco, at least the way I had been. And so um, my agents got together and said, you know, you've been talking about trying TV. If, you're, if you really wanna be serious and give it a serious shot, you should take this opportunity where you don't know where you're gonna go and just go to Los Angeles and see what happens. What about your experience? Are you originally from New York, or did you move to New York for the... the um, I'm from Philadelphia, but I moved to um, New York after college, so I've been there for a while. But I, I mean, my experience, it's if you want to get a job um, writing for a television show, then the majority of them are out there, the majority of writers' rooms are out there, so LA, it's like no argument. That's where you've got to be. Uh, I've, I mean, I've lived in New York. I've never lived in LA, except for a small amount of time when I was working on a specific project. But um, 
So I feel like if you've got, um, if, you have, if your career is at some point where you can get meetings, like if you can go out there and be in the and go and be able to get meetings, and then that, you know, that's, the, that's the thing that you can be at, go like in New York if you're not trying to be a um, staff. If um, you're not, if you don't have that access, then I think the shoes factor of being out there is important. That if yeah. you're out, out there, because the fact is everywhere you go, you meet people, and, and, and it really is, as well, in New York, you can't do that. So if you're at a point where you're really trying to get connections, I think being in LA is, is sort of invaluable because you always meet people that are involved, and that's a way of getting your foot in the door. If, 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 um, you know, so, so in that way, I, I've managed to not do that, but I, I, and it definitely has negative repercussions. Being in New York, I think being a writer, if you want to be a screenwriter or whatever, it's, it definitely is not. Um, the wisest choice because it, it, um, there's just it's no comparison in terms of how much work there is, how many people you need. Um, but it, it's possible. But I think anyone, especially if you're saying if you want to write television, um, LA, it's, it's you've got you kind of have to be there unless you're already established. Listen, because uh, you were born in New York, is that my correct? I just think it's hilarious that I'm sitting on this panel. <laughs> <laughs> really. I mean, I have one 15-minute short film. <laughs> well, well, actually, it's a little more than that. But so, yes. What did you want to know? <laughs> <laughs> well, well you've also said that. some of the most amazing things at this conference. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not now, though. I think I should sit over there. <laughs> what, what? Well, well, you know, well, it, was, it was partly about this whole notion of geography because I think yeah. it's something that writers obsess about. I think that for a long time, as, as playwrights. We all probably obsessed with the fact that, oh my God, we have to move to New York. And with things like the advent of uh, the National New Play Network, this becomes less and less of a, a, you know, of, a, of, a, of a concern for writers nationwide in regional markets. But I'm wondering if still there is this feeling for writers of other media if being in one of the major capitals, particularly in Los Angeles, is it a driving concern of yours? Maybe possibly not. If you um, well, you know, for me, um, I, I don't know that I can really actually answer that question. I'm afraid of Los Angeles. I just always feel ugly there. <laughs> you know, so I mean, I'm not, I don't function well in LA, and I've never thought of myself as a person who um, <coughs> could move into television. I never had the confidence, and I started writing, this, this is going to become like a therapy session. <laughs> it sounds like that, doesn't it? I'll build you later. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, but, uh, I just, I, I also didn't start writing until I was 45, and I really did take time out to raise my son. So the whole, my whole experience of being a parent, and being a writer, and being an actress, sort of moved me along in a specific direction, and I did go to LA as an actor, but never as, as a writer, and, and to, to make some, I do believe that if you want to be a playwright, you need to be in New York, I do believe that. That you get all the stimulation and you get to, to work with some of the best people in the world when you're in New York. So that's very interesting to me, and, and any time, three of my short plays have been made into short films, and I've experienced that, and one of them was actually made in Syria, which was, it was an interesting, intense experience, and it happened just before the war, and it was about a deaf child. Mm -hmm. And so the whole, the whole experience was actually in silence, and then that whole territory where it was filmed is now destroyed, and, mm -hmm. and the war happened a week later. So my experiences have been intense and short and not really um, like these gentlemen who have earned a living and I, I've never done that. I mean, for me, it's been a side, sort of remarkable extension of trying to be a creative person. Yeah, uh, this, is a, this is a two part uh, question for you now. So, if you've had the experience of having something that was originally written for the stage, which has now been adapted, uh, um, that's, that's, you know, what's your experience? I know I have some friends who. They, they just want to take the money and run and say, let somebody else do the adaptation. I can see this as a play or a short story. I don't want to deal with, you know, the, you know, the adaptation. Others want to, want to have the right first appeal to write the first uh, script. So that's, you know, what's your experience in, in, in that regard. The second part of it is, in tandem with that, we know that as playwrights, there's no shortage of people who are willing uh, talk backs or, or <coughs> critics in the press willing to tell us how to rewrite our own, uh, our own plays. Um, in Hollywood, and in the, the entertainment industry, it's magnified considerably. The amount of people, not only who 
feel that they have a right to, but also do have a legal right to tell you because they've paid for it. Is the paycheck a little bit of a spoonful of sugar making medicine go down, or what, is it's it frustrating? A, it's not a small spoonful of sugar. It's a <laughs> you know bag. Right? Like it's like a it's a bag of sugar to make the medicine go down. But I would say just about the first part, just for me, is that like adaptation is an art form. Not everyone excels at it. So you know, some people should take the money and run. I, I think people who adapt work are very generally. This is very general, obviously. Are get paid to do that because they're skilled at what they do. And just because I wrote a play doesn't mean that I have the wherewithal or the skill set to turn that into a film. Um, although I'll probably, in my contract, have like a first shot at it. Right. If it, they bought it, then it's theirs. So maybe they'll give me that first shot as a courtesy and maybe I'll knock it out of the park. But right. probably after the first pass, someone who does that for a living is going to come in and like take over. So I have to know that. And then the second thing is that I think it's a very different thing. Like it's about where agency rests, right? Because in playwriting, you you don't you don't want someone to tell you wait to your play. Do you know what I mean? Right. In television, <laughs> it's your show, but you can't make it without all of these other people. There's right. a difference. Do you know what I mean? And like they're invested in a financial way that you cannot be. And there's so many people that have to say yes to something. Like 700 people have to say yes, and if just one person says no, it stops. Right. Um, at least in that venue, and then there's other venues that you pursue. So, I don't know, it's sort of like when you've sat enough talkbacks as a playwright, you stop hearing the crazy, like you stop hearing that person who's like, I didn't like this part, and I think it should be this. And what you hear is, okay, they had a problem on page five with this thing, what does that mean? Like, where is that coming from? Right. And so when you start to approach television notes, and I don't have any, I, under my understanding of writing is that it's much more shark invested, but is that in television at least, when you get notes from producers, no one's trying to tank your show, they're all trying to make it better. And so the idea is, where, because they wanted, they wanted to, uh, <coughs> in television is that they wanted to end up on television. And so if everyone's goal is the same, then it becomes listening to notes that you don't want to hear and going, all right, how can I satisfy this note and still maintain what I'm doing? How can I hear where that note is coming from, make the adjustment, make the change, and still try and, and satisfy my artistic integrity? Right. But I feel very different that like plays are my play, that's my play. And I'm, if I don't like what you have to say about it, then screw off. In television you can't say screw off, so you have to sort of develop a thicker skin and learn how to hear a note and not freak out and just kind of deal with it. That's my, that's my experience. I agree with everything that Steve just said with the exception or, or the uh, argue like I want our panel to no, fight. Steve, <laughs> <laughs> uh, with, with the exception of uh, notes that executives giving are all about trying to make it better for TV. Um, my experience is that notes that executives are given are more often to preserve their own job, and they want to be able to ride the middle so delicately that if it doesn't work, they can blame somebody else. If it works, they can take the credit. Yeah. Mm. But that's a um, given, but I, I think that's a given. Yeah, um, and you know, a major significant difference in television, even more so than film, but it's certainly in film, is that it's, it's for profit. It is so corporate driven um, that it's, it's almost, uh, it's preposterous, it's hilarious. I've been in situations working in those environments where <clears throat> there'll be a, a script reading of some sort with a room full of suits, and somebody will literally say, um, that character needs to be taller. <laughs> it's like, okay, you know. Um, and the yeah, actors really are given as suggestions. Um, TV and film are given as directives. They sound like suggestions. Yes. yes. Yeah. Um, you should say, how tall? Exactly, yeah. Um, you know, they, they don't want to hear, well, why is it you want that character taller? They're just making it freaking taller. Yeah, yeah. Um, then with regard to, uh, do you want the, the, the playwright to just cash the check and let somebody else do it, et cetera. Again, as Steve said, it's representation. I certainly want the opportunity, the ability to, um, to get my client additional work in that regard, if in fact they're the one that's best suited for it. If they're not, I turn to the rest of my roster and see if there's somebody else that can do it. Um, but yeah, certainly, as Steve said, it's, it's all about um, who has the chops to do it. 
I mean, a couple of these off of, um, I mean, I disagree with everything these two said, and I, I agree with everything that Leslie said. <laughs> um, but in, in terms of the, I, I guess, in, in terms of the theater and, and television, since the goal is seeing it done, getting it produced, um, whether it's television or not, in terms of taking the notes, I think it's, you've got to be very, very careful about um, knowing what notes to take and what not. The, the notes that you don't take that you're going to stop the project by not taking a note, and the notes you take that, that um, will make it go. And sometimes you have to, um, this is true theater, but less so, but in television certainly, if you, if you, you can get notes that, you, that um, if you take, that's going to kill the project. So, um, I mean, recently I was working, I'm working on a pilot. Um, for a network, and, I, and I, got some, I got some notes that I knew if I took these notes, these are the notes that are gonna make it not happen eventually. I just, I just knew it. And so you can find ways to do rewrites that you can, you can convince them. You're not gonna win an argument on the phone or whatever you say, well, you're not gonna win that fight. You, you, you can then, through the work, sell them and slowly convince them because they don't, you know, as, as, as both these guys were saying, people are fearful of their jobs, they're fearful about making money, they, they need, when you're on a conference call with these guys, their boss is on the call, they're listening to them, they, they want to feel like they can give notes that sound um, intelligent, yet critical, yet leading to something, and they'll they, um, all from will be the notes that would stop it dead. And so, you know, it, it's just being smart about how to get what you want um, by the end of it. Um, and so you have to kind of be careful being having a clear idea of not like when you're, oh, I've got this um, note from the executive, so if I follow this, then I'm going to get my pilot shot of the show's going to You're going to be like, well, what's the larger picture? Am I going to lose the essence of this character if I take that note? Am I going to lose the driving force of what the premise of this um, project is by taking that note? Because they don't, you know better than, if you, if you know what you, you know better than they do. So you've got to keep an eye on that with being kind of smart about it. I think. Can I get I, I, I a little thing to say? That I, I did actually have a job. I was hired by HBO to write a pilot on, on someone who, what they wanted was a, a story of a woman who was an agent, a, a, a literary agent, actually. It was sort of the Sue Mayer story, and they hired me to write it. And so I went off and I wrote a pilot. And the note thing, um, I find that those of you who can take notes and sit in the room and know how to deal with them is crucial. And I was very naive about that. And when I walked into the room and sat at the table with seven men, as the only woman in the room <coughs> writing a story about a woman, and what I was told in that room was that's not how women behave. <laughs> and I was like, well, fuck you. I mean, I couldn't really believe that that was the response, and I didn't know how to be graceful about it. <laughs> yeah. and, and correlated it to a continuation of the job. I, I, really, I just didn't. I just sat there and, and had all that resistance in a lifetime of yeah. issue around it. Actually, the actual note was that's not how women behave, and they should be taller. I think yeah. that's, that's the thing. That, that yeah. the, See, I wouldn't know how to. And I didn't. I didn't. I, Job yeah. <laughs> well, let's let's field some questions from the audience. Cricket over here, yeah, and then over here, Nina. I have two questions, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. One is, um, Bruce, how did David get on your radar? How long ago? And what was that like? How did how did you guys hook up? And then how did HBO know? Breaking in story. Here we go. Um, David and I have been working together for about six years, and um, the, the the reality of our uh, how I sort of found David was uh, it was at a point when I was developing my roster and was really paying attention to, to what was going on, and there was somebody else at the time who was on my roster, who was no longer on my roster, who said, you know, you really need to pay attention to this friend of mine, David Barcats. Because he wrote plays at the time, or uh, he was writing everything at the time, and um, I went and saw a piece of his. Uh, in a reading, and I've never laughed so hard in a reading, mm -hmm. and um, I, I knew I had to work with this guy. Um, our relationship is, is I work with him um, primarily theatrically. Um, he has uh, representation that really handles his TV and film work. That's not to say that I, I don't uh, read his work and provide you know, any sort of feedback that he's interested in receiving. Is that both parts of the question? No, and then let's oh. just tell Leslie, how, how did HBO find you? I mean, how did that happen? Yeah, um, 
the way that they, Colin Callender was at the head of the guy. Is he still now? No. Is he still, he's not there? No. Um, well, it's actually sort of a, a weird little story, which is that I'm very good friends with the playwright Richard Greenberg. Do, do people recognize that name? He's a good friend of mine. And we decided years ago that we wanted to write a short play together for the EST Marathon, and we wanted to combine our names and make it an anonymous person, and just see that we just played this game. So we made Elise Ehrlich was our name, which was the combination. I can't believe I'm saying this, and there's a camera and all that. <laughs> so, I know, I know, I know. Yeah, yeah. So we we wrote this thing together about a woman, a, a ball busting woman who just took charge of things, and I actually did it. I performed it. And it did well. It, 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 it created a little bit of a stir, and it got a good review. So Colin Callender came to see it, and he hired, he met with us, and Rich didn't want to do it, so I ended up doing it. And I did, that's how it happened. What, it, what, yeah, I'm sorry. What's very true is that television in particular has a real fondness and affinity for playwrights. At least they say that they do. Yeah, but um, no. But they do. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the, the primary not result me. Is They didn't like me. Just in terms of character development and imagination and things of that sort. But then they oftentimes um, have a way of sort of all the stuff that made them interesting and beating all of that out of them. Yes. Steve, uh, how did you find representation? Uh, I did they find you? In my first year, I love when you said, well, I found him when he was like on the street. <laughs> yeah. 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 That, was yeah. really, that was the G version. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. I was going to ask if, they, if David's okay. story is the same as Bruce's. G I'm sorry? Would you tell the exact same story that Bruce just told? <laughs> yes, Bruce um, had written, I went to a reading and I never left on it. Yeah. <laughs> 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 the guy from me. Um, yeah, that was me and a mutual, a mutual friend, like, I don't know how that said, that said the same thing she said, oh, this guy you've got to meet, and that was, sure, did you do that at all? Oh, mine's not really interesting. I mean, I was in my first year at NYU, and I had, uh, I wrote the play that we were talking about on the same French panel yesterday, Octopus, and, uh, and some, uh, Bill Fennelly, who's a director in New York, drew, uh, passed it along to Mary Harden and Harden Curtis, and then they called me in, they said we'd like to have a meeting, and I was like, oh, that's great. So I went in, and like through the entire meeting, I was like, I was like, so, you know, I was literally on my best part, I was like, what, what do I need to do? Like, what can I do to work with you? And literally at a certain point, she's like, Steve, like, we're, we're here to try and convince you to let us represent you, so you can calm down. And I was like, I did not understand that that was the context of the meeting. And so then I was like, yes. <laughs> So Hart and Curtis are still my theatrical yeah, events yeah. now. When, when was that? A year? 2008. Uh, thanks. Yeah. I, I, my question's similar, but it's, it's about adaptation. So I have these plays out there, and they're published in short stories, and maybe hopefully a novel someday. And, and A, how do I try to maximize that opportunity for somebody to say, ooh, we could turn this into a film? Mm -hmm. And then uh, the second part of that question is how much control like, let's say my next play gets picked up, it goes to Broadway, somebody wants to turn it into a film. How much control do I have, or is it at that point I just have to let go and take the money, or what? I feel like I'm, I'm jumping in on all this, so do it. someone else do it. Jump away. All I was going to say is it depends who you are. I would have, like, if I had a play that went to Broadway, and then um, someone said, we want to make a movie out of it, we want to buy the rights to do this, I would have little or no input in the movie. Probably. Other than saying um, Leslie and Greenberg should really get together. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> Can Leslie and Richard Greenberg please do the adaptation? <laughs> yeah. I need you to hire Elise Ehrlich. So <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but you know, Tracy Lowe, but like, for instance, I, I would feel relatively certain, I could be completely wrong with people watching on the internet, but like that Tracy Letts probably had a lot of input into August Osage County. The adaptation of that that's coming out because he's a Pulitzer Prize winning, Tony Award winning playwright, and also the producers of the film are the producers of, of the play. So there was obviously an interest in you know taking that particular work and creating a successful adaptation. 
I think going back to what you said originally about adaptation, I think the wisest thing really is that if you were to, if were to play with the word about the, how the adaptation is, as you're saying, to let a professional do it, the fact is that even if, if you know the most about it, it's two totally different mediums, and there have been so few good adaptations of plays to films. I mean, I can, off the top of my head, think of maybe two. And, um, and the reason why they generally suck is because they're holding on to what made the play great, and if there's something where it's, you know, let someone come in, and because the, the thing that a playwright might love about it is the thing's going to fuck it up as a film. Uh, and, and so I absolutely agree that there's somebody that, that you know, you put your input in and do whatever, but I think if you're a playwright sometimes, it's not fair to the screenwriter that, or someone that doesn't feel it's so invested in um, ego or certain aspects of it. Um, you know, someone else is probably going to serve you better, and in the end, it's going to be better for you. Well, it's things that you wouldn't even—I mean, it's things that you wouldn't even think about. It. Like I'm totally going to steal a story now, but Doug Wright, who's one of the uh, guest teachers at NYU, was telling us the story about the uh, the process of turning quills into a movie, and that um, he went got you know. Uh, summoned, not summoned, but he was requested to come to, uh, first of all, he was allowed to be on the set a lot, which the director wanted, which is unusual, but that um, he was sort of requested that, to go to Kate Winslet's trailer, and she said to him, and you know, this is, she was Kate Winslet, but she wasn't like, now we've been Kate Winslet. And so um, she said to him, you know, this is my favorite monologue in the entire script, I love it, it's really beautiful, and he's like, me too, and she, thank you, probably nervously, and she said, I don't know, Doug Wright does anything nervously, but she said thank you, and then um, she said, I really think that I can accomplish this with a look, and he had to get over, like, all of his sort of, like, you know, playwright pride to have this moment, and so he said to the director, let's, you know, he didn't want to offend her, and so I'm probably butchering this, if anyone repeats this story to Doug Wright, but uh, to Doug Wright, he, he said, let's film it both ways. Like, we'll film the monologue, she's ready to do the monologue, and then we'll give her a chance to do the thing that she wants to do. So she did the monologue, and he said that it was like, earth-shatteringly brilliant. And she did every little nuance of it was his favorite thing ever. And then she did it with a look, and she was 100% right. And that's what's in the film. And like, it's not something that he would have done or know to do or any right. of that stuff because it's a completely different medium and that's the place where having never written a screenplay the idea that i would then look at someone and be like i'm going to do a stunning adaptation of my own play with no distance or education is like i don't know who i would have to be that's ballsy like i don't know it's so interesting yeah, i love that story yeah that's good. um uh, i mean everybody has their own process but in writing a television show it seems like we were talking about knowing the ending of plays when you sort of begin knowing where you're going. And with the television show, I mean, every episode you have to like sort of know that ending. What is the, the process like in the room with so many other writers, like hands in the pot? How does it become complete, essentially, for like a season? Well, um, it's typically a showrunner. Um, a showrunner is an individual who is essentially oftentimes the creator of the show, an executive producer of the show, but they're also the head writer of the show. Um, they're the ones that control the writer room and control sort of the overarching uh, vision for the show. Um, interestingly, why are you smirking? <laughs> you just said we've worked together six years and I, you don't know I always have stuff. That's true. Um, this could be um, the end of a beautiful thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes, working, you start with That's true. Uh, because of the, the recent um, re-release reboot of Arrested Development, there was obviously a lot of press around uh, the creator Mitch Hurwitz. That's how you pronounce his name. And um, he was talking about how uh, he had envisioned uh, an, an entirety for an entire five, six, seven um, season arc for all of these characters, and how it was all going to sort of tie back in. And that there were seeds of jokes that were planted in season one, episode four, that didn't pay off in the initial run of the show. And if people were paying attention, you know, in episode six of the new season, that joke's finally gonna pay off. Um, you know, so it's, it's a very, very specific, it's a very different um, process of being able to write a half, a half hour comedy is a little bit different because they're, those are typically episodic and there are storylines that, that are continuing. It's, it's much more relevant for hour-long dramas um, to have sort of a satisfying episode that also propels the characters and stories forward. They want to have a sense, too, that you, like, because they're going to have input. Like, whoever buys your show 
is going to have input on all of that stuff. Like maybe, you know, I think if you're if you're selling to like cable, it's a little less likely, but definitely network. They're going to have a lot of thoughts about where it's going to go. But I do, I can tell you that the the very first thing I got lucky and and, and it was luck and sold something very quickly. Um, a TV pilot, um, and it was bought outright. But one of the reasons that Sony bought it was because at the end of the pilot, it ended on page like 34, and at the end, of, and then there was two pages at the end that was, uh, you know, next up on teeth, boom, 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 boom. By the end of the first season, boom, 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 boom. So that they had a sense of like not only because one of the questions you get at the end of your pilot from everyone on the planet is, what's what's every week going to be like? What's the story engine like? How is this going to run from week to week? Even if you think it's the most obvious thing in the planet, that question is coming. Like it's coming, right. and so at least for me, it's coming. I don't know. Other people might be more skilled. So, um, so it, they want to know that you have a sense of not just what happens in the pilot, but of the direction. It's what we talked about intention. You know what I mean? They want to know that you've got a plan for where you'd like for it to go, and then maybe they're going to tell you to go somewhere different with it. But at least you have a you have a plan beyond what that, that pilot. Of that pilot. I'm sorry? Whatever came up that It's with Sony now because they bought it outright. So like they have control over where it goes next. I'm rewriting it. Are you? <laughs> 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 well, they, like, do they keep you in the loop? I mean, it may be shelved for 10 years, but in 10 years when they decide to dust it off, they, they call you? I think they have four years, actually. But okay. I, it's, it's uh, uh, they, yeah, I mean, the, you know, the executive that, that has sort of oversight over it is working on it. It was a really killer season last year for um, spec scripts. Like a lot of things sold from pitch, not a lot of spec scripts sold last year. So I think they're still waiting to see what's gonna happen this year. But it is, I, I was surprised that it sold frankly because it's a cable half hour with very few places that it can actually end up in the long run. So it was unusual. That's why I say it was lucky. I was very lucky. Um, you, sure, to, to your point of uh, reversion, after four years or 10 years and a script comes back, um, that's great in some regards. But any other executive is going to say, well, if Sony couldn't get it done in four years, what makes anybody think that we can get it done? That's true, sort of. But then the only other thing that I would say is that you also, what you learn really quickly, and you already know all this, but like what you learn really quickly and that I did not know is that studios have certain places that they can sell things because of uh, deal mechanisms. And then there are certain places where, so there's like, Certain places that Sony can go and make a deal and sell something and get it on TV. There's certain places that Sony doesn't have a model for how to sell to. So there's channels that you just can't go to. And so there's outlets that some studios can go to that others can't. And is your project worth reinventing the wheel to try and figure out how to do financing with an existing studio? And like those are things that you're largely spared from. But then you'll ask weird questions like, well, why didn't we go to this network to try? Because it seems like it'd be a good fit. And when the answer comes back, there's no model in place to sell to them. It's kind of like, oh, wait, there's this whole other world of financing that you as a writer don't have anything to do with that you slowly start to become. It's like peeling back layers, you know what I mean? Where you don't always know exactly what's going on. Did you go in and pitch it? Did your agent submit it? Uh, I worked on it, I got really lucky, and a producer, uh, Eric Jenderson, is a really great writer, producer who did Band of Brothers for HBO, read an early draft of the script, gave me some notes, he was really committed because it's about dentists, and his father was like the dentist for president, uh, uh, for one of the for Truman, I think it was Truman's dentist, and he would fly in from San Francisco to give him like dental work. But so, so he was invested in it because it was about dentists. And um, he did uh, two passes with me on the script of sort of like, here are my notes. And you know, it was kind of things like, right now it feels like you could pick this up and set it in a hat shop and it would be the same thing. So like, make it really about dentists, don't just make it set in a dental practice. And at first I was like, well, screw your note. And then I was like, oh, actually that's an obvious note that's important and it just meant that I needed to do hard work. Um, and so uh, they had a pod deal with Sony, and so the very first place that he handed it to was Sony, and Sony read it, and then a week later they bought it. And so I didn't have to have a meeting with anyone the entire time. This is what I'm saying. It's a freak story. It's complete luck. And if I were to present that to you as skill or having anything to do with my like work effort, that would be a lie. I just got very lucky. Yeah, it was you a took sequence. his notes and you made it better. It's, so that's true. But yeah, you don't have to build me up. I'm fine. I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying that like, sometimes people will present to you. Sometimes people will present to you sort of like, well, I got into television because I was brave enough to take a. I handed my script to an executive and they said this and like, 
whatever. Everybody's story, like Winnie Holtzman, who created My So-Called Life and wrote on Thursday, I mean, she wrote the book for Wicked and everything. She told us, like, I remember at NYU, she told us that it's like losing your virginity. Like, everybody's story is different, but it roughly ends up the same. Like, at the end of it, you've had sex. But, like, how it happened is completely different. And I think that's true of television, too. It's like, how you get involved with television is completely your own journey. And like, you can't model it on what anyone else has done. But at the end of it, you've had sex. But at the end of it, you're in television. Yeah. As the resident Luddite, the title of this is writing for film, theater, or internet. And you've been talking about television, but what are some of the what does internet mean in that thing? Bruce, mm -hmm. <laughs> do you have plans to write exclusively? For, not exclusively, probably. But uh, no. So no. it's a strange title then. Um, no stranger than Mobisode. It should be no surprise to anyone who's got a smartphone that there's an extraordinary amount of content that's being created now for for the internet. Uh, there's a show, is it called Blue? Oh, it's this. on wigs. Yeah, there are this, this kind Which of I shouldn't make thing. I shouldn't make fun of it because it's like very famous people started this network that's programming yeah. by women for women, but not like Lifetime where it's like yeah. movies of Jeopardy. It's like actual like. And it's uh, what's the what's so blue is who's the actress? Now? Julia Stiles. Julia Stiles plays this woman who's got a secret. Her secret is that she's a prostitute. She's keeping it from her whole family. And the episodes are, like are they like a minute? Yeah. Yeah. Am I wrong yeah. about that? They, has anyone seen this? No, it's longer. It's more like nine minutes. Nine, nine minute, nine minute episodes. So oh, that's what we need. We need a show like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is, it, is it Netflix? Yeah, is it great. Netflix yeah. doing shows no. now? Yeah, Netflix is doing shows, but Netflix is doing like for half hours an hour long. Yeah, yeah. they're doing, doing kind of rest of yeah. 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 And you know, the, I think the reason that it was put on the panel, I mean, I didn't plan the panel, but but and as as much as we we may want to look down our noses at this you know the short form content, it's another opportunity to get paid for your writing, mm -hmm. to get paid for what you love to I, do. I, and, uh, can I just like yeah. I anybody in this room that like and like maybe you'll hate me because I'm on all the rest of the panels today, but anybody that's like looking down their nose at short form programming should probably stop doing that because <laughs> your short plays are can be a calling card for you. It's how people. Yeah learn about who you are, it's a great opportunity to come to things like this and get seen. The exact same thing with webisodes, like a lot of people enter television yeah. by creating yeah. these webisodes that they can film themselves, yeah. they're lower budget, they are mm -hmm. things that they can do with like if you borrow your friend, like I've got a friend who works in a studio, he's got a red cam, I can get it for two days, maybe I can film three episodes of this five minute thing and get it up on the air and maybe that doesn't mean it's going to become a television series but people can see what I'm doing oh, in a way that's... The cat got a development team. The grumpy cat. cat. Grumpy grumpy cat. cat. Wow. The cat meme got a yeah. development team. But I'm saying that that's, a, that's one way that the internet I think is changing things is that that breaks down like if you can create your own content and put it up there and it actually gets seen like it ends up on Funny or Die or it ends up like, it ends up getting picked up by other, um, I don't know even what to call them, websites, outlets on the internet, then that's a way for managers to find you, it's a way for uh, agents at some place like Innovative to find you, it's a way for a, a one enterprising executive to see, yeah. you know, to see your digital version of Mothra's adventures and then right. go, what is he doing? I want to know more about him and find out. Do you know what I mean? So Wait, in that it, respect. Is it, it, is it Baltimore Center Stage who now has those monologues? They have a whole series of monologues. They've commissioned writers to write short, minute, three minute um, monologues. And you can go see some extraordinary writers um, uh, from all over the country who've submitted to, to uh, Baltimore Center Stage on their website. You can just click through them all. And they're paying writers to do that. They're creating all of this content. And some of those writers have now been contacted by other people to say, hey, I like that monologue. Is it from a play? And they, of course, lie and say, yes, it is. And they'll have a few in three weeks. And, uh, <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, I think that the, the, the internet has sort of changed how we can be accessed as writers and how we can gain access to the industry. There was, yes, question. Yes, I have two questions. A follow-up to this. If you have some kind of a webisode, are you protected? And then the other question is very simple and straightforward. If you have a reading and you want to invite industry professionals, is there a time during the week, a day that, that's better than others? I'd say the first part, you're never protected from anything if you're a writer. You're yeah. never protected. You can do all the little games, mail yourself your script, yeah. register your yeah. WGA. Yeah. You're never protected from anything ever. 
That's you can take that as a universal rule. The other part of it is loose. Yeah, I mean. It, there's no sort of uh, silver bullet on that. I mean, typically Mondays, because that's when people have days off. Um, or, you know, there's there's typically no fever that night, but that's changing too. It's it's really subjective. You know, I when clients are putting together readings, I try to pay attention to see what else is opening at that time, what's going to be drawing attention and focus. Um, yeah, Thursdays, I don't know. Open bar, anytime open yeah. bar is probably I, 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 just provide, I agree about the protection thing. Like I, I think there's a certain point where you have to stop worrying about it. That's, yeah. It's a little bit of a Chardonnay problem. Yeah. Like it's like when you get, when, you know, I mean like if, you, if you're worried that someone's going to steal your webisode idea that only four people have watched on the internet, then like, I mean, you know, it becomes an issue of like, at a certain point, people can't take your ideas because they've been so saturated. Like, if someone were to try and steal the idea for Arrested Development, it'd be really obvious that that's what you were doing because it's Arrested Development and many people have seen it. Like, if someone tried to steal, like, at a certain point, it's like, you write a play, you send it out, if someone's gonna steal that idea, they're gonna steal it. I think that that happens far less often than people are concerned about when they're initially starting their writing careers. I don't think I have met a single writer in my career who's ever had a story where they know for a fact that somebody stole their idea. Now, I have had many people who said, you know what, somebody beat me to the punch. My play is very similar, but they got a production first. And that happens all the time. It's called spe spontaneous creation, and you can't be inured from that. And very often when you submit to certain places, they'll have you sign a release that says, we are on the receiving end of thousands and thousands of ideas a day, and uh, there's such a thing called spontaneous creation. And just because you sent us a script that's about a dog that lives in Alaska doesn't mean that we don't have five other submissions that are also about a dog in Alaska. And just because we produce a film that's about a dog in Alaska doesn't mean we necessarily stole your script. And unless you have a paper chain where you sent them the script, they said thank you very much, and then they took that script and had two or three meetings, decided to pass on it, and then made a film about a dog in Alaska, you've got very little recourse. And I, I, I think you're absolutely right. You should not obsess about this. I mean, I even have students obsessing about well, I'm not sure if I should take a playwriting course and share all my ideas in a workshop because I don't want somebody else to steal that idea. This is a freshman student who's never written a 10-minute play before. I'm like, I think the, I think it's Although, a little yeah, I mean, premature it's, to be obsessing. It's, it's also writing. about the execution of the idea. I and mean, if you if you yeah. sort of broke down at the most basic level the premise of just about every sitcom ever, they're identical. Seinfeld is about a group of friends in New York. So is Friends. So is you know. I'm sure they're more contemporary references. How I met your mother, I don't know. I just love that you were like, everyone. Oh. And then you were saying, Here's the example of the lead Yeah, line. exactly. Um, I have a question for Les. Uh, most of us went and saw the festival last night and saw Leslie's play, The Favor, which she just had the film done. So I want to know, in the film version, do we go into the room and see mom, and do we see the picture of the French boy? I've not seen it since you know, so I guess I don't have to. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's ruined. Oh, oh, it's ruined. Oh, it's just a human being. It's just a human I'm that person you hate now. <laughs> yes, yes, and yes. It's, it's um, once I wrote the, the one act for it, one of the things that I, I like writing one acts, I always feel that it, it, it gives you something to do when other things aren't working out so well. And, and it does give you some measure of control. There are one act festivals, you can get things out, it's fast, it's quick, it happens, it goes up. There's a certain thing to writing a one act and have, telling the whole story in a short period of time. And um, I had just had a play that was booked to open, actually, this summer, and it was dropped. The play was just dropped, which was sad and humiliating for me. So my response to that was to write this play, because I had gotten a picture in the mail from a distant relative of my mother in a garden in France at the age of four. And she had a big bow in her hair and a huge exuberant smile on her face. And she, and she was holding hands with a little boy, and on the back it said Flavio. And that was the whole thing. She looked happier than I had ever seen her in her life. And so I took that one little picture and I wrote the play. 
And after I wrote the play, I thought, you know, it's possible this could be a film. And given that, you know, I'm 65 this summer, I'm looking for new challenges, and I thought maybe film is something I could play with a little bit. Particularly a short film. I happen to like sh the short form. So I thought, let me bring the mother into the film. And so I put the mother in the bedroom, and every time she walks out, we go into the bedroom with her. And we do see in the opening shot, we do see the mother on the bed. It starts with her in profile, and then it goes, you see the Ellen sitting next to her, and there are books all over her bed because she was looking at pictures of gardens in France. And you open up the book, and there's the picture of my mother in France with the big bow and the big exuberant expression on her face and this little French boy in a sailor outfit. It's the most amazing picture. And then the play unfolds. And also what happens is, at the end now, um, close your ears, oh no, no. At the end now, um, uh, the, in the film, um, Ralph goes into the bedroom and you see him standing by the mother's bed. And the mother's played by Olympia Dukakis. And, and she, um, <laughs> uh, and and you so and her eyes are closed and he leans over her and just as he gets to her she opens her eyes and looks right at him and he chooses in that moment to kiss her so he moves in and he kisses her and she closes her eyes and receives the kiss and then one tear rolls down her face and he just wipes it away and that's it. Was so it hard it, to adapt it over to screen? It wasn't. It wasn't. I mean, it was like a one-day deal. And I was so fortunate that I sent it to this company, the only independent film company I know. It's run by women, and it's called Fugitive Films. And they actually gave me a full production. It was, I mean, it, they really made a film out of this. It was really, it was awesome. It was awesome. Okay, please uh, put your hands together and thank our friends.